Hi everyone, this is Carol Hinkle, president of Triple E. I wanna welcome you all to our third Zoom webinar. I do also wanna remind you that we'd love to have your questions throughout the lecture by hitting your Q&A button and typing it in. If you need additional assistance on that, we did include instructions yesterday in the email that Glenn sent out to you. So feel free to put on your thinking caps. I'd now like to ask Michael Orlansky of our program committee to please introduce today's speaker. Michael? Thank you. Well, hello, everyone. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome Sean McManon. He's been superintendent of schools in Winooski, Vermont, since 2013. Before that, he spent 12 years at Champlain Valley Union High School in Hinesburg, eight years as principal. In 2010, the Vermont Principals Association honored Sean as the Robert F. Pierce Secondary Principal of the Year, and he's received many other honors and awards for his leadership. Sean has also taught in California, Alaska, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire, mainly with students who have special behavioral and educational needs. As a Peace Corps volunteer in Botswana, Southern Africa, he taught students and worked with Botswanan educators to develop new curricula and methods. Sean earned his bachelor's degree at Penn State, master's in education at Leslie College in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and he carried out advanced studies in educational leadership at St. Michael's College. The title of today's talk is Education in Vermont Today, Challenges, Opportunities, and Innovations in Our School. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Sean McMahon. Thank you. Thanks, Michael, and uh, thanks everybody. I, I wish I could see everybody, but um, these days we're we're kind of working with with what we got and uh, but I really appreciate uh, uh, your organization inviting me to spend some time with you guys and um, uh, I understand that the format is kind of lecture and then questions and answer um, and uh, I, I always love to have have these uh, opportunities be more of a conversation or a dialogue than a lecture so uh, certainly um, uh, if, if we're able to, uh, go ahead and write your questions, as they've said in the, uh, um, the Q&A field. And if um, I can maybe even stay abreast of those as we go, I'll try to answer them as we, as we move forward. So um, I just want to, I want to label the fact that we're in very uh, uh, unique and strange uh, times right now. And um, uh, I hope that all of you are, are, are staying uh, healthy and active and uh, that you and your families are all uh, safe and healthy. Um, I feel very fortunate to live in Vermont right now. Um, and I think we have all done a fabulous job of combating the virus and uh, which has allowed for um, a lot of healthy activities for us to be able to, to take advantage of and uh, to maintain our, our physical and our, and our mental health. Um, and for our ability to, to get our students back in school, and um, particularly for our youngest ones who um, are growing just exponentially all the time. And so the ability to get them back in for their academic and their uh, socialization is just of the utmost importance. And it is a concern. You know, uh, some colleagues of mine, um, you know, we've been meeting as a regional superintendents group. And you know, now that teachers have been back for a few weeks and meeting with students, you know, we're finding that uh, due to um, remote learning for a couple months at the last at the end of last school year, and then uh, you know the summer and the beginning of this school year, we are finding that students have not made as much progress as we would have expected, and so that's very very uh, concerning to us. Um, so when we talk about the um, challenges, opportunities, and innovations uh, in, in uh, education today, I think first and foremost, that's going to be one of our biggest challenges right now is how do we get our arms around um, 
what students, what progress students have made and what they haven't made, and then design learning to try and meet those needs in a very responsive way um, as we move forward. Because um, um, uh, what we've learned, particularly in the last 15 years or so of education of uh, research is that we need to meet students where they are. It no longer are the days of we walk in front of a classroom, we, um, uh, we teach, and we hope that students uh, uh, get everything that they need and then they pass a test and they move on to uh, the next unit and eventually on to the next grade. We've become a lot more responsive in our uh, instruction in our assessment and uh, differentiating for students who are, uh, have different levels of understanding, different backgrounds. Um, and so uh, we, we have a lot of work to do in that area. And in this year in particular, it's gonna be pretty challenging as we um, are still navigating a, a pretty fragile system, um, giving staffing challenges during the pandemic and um, heading into uh, the winter season and the flu season and so forth. So I think that that's kind of most of our, most of our immediate challenge. Um, I did want to um, back up a little bit and I just wanted to, uh, I appreciate Michael's introduction and uh, I wanted to add a little bit of uh, meat to uh, my background. And then I wanted to talk about um, uh, the Winooski School District and some of our um, demographics and our, our unique uh, qualities and characteristics. But I think a couple things that, that I wanted to share with everybody that, that don't necessarily come out in a resume are that um, uh, I feel like uh, some of the people and the places that have shaped me as a person and a learner, um, you know, were listed in that resume, but, um, um, and some of them weren't, but uh, the, the people that have been the most, um, uh, integral in my life are my parents. And, um, you know, both my parents came from uh, abject poverty uh, in and around Cincinnati, Ohio. And my father uh, made his way um, to a uh, undergraduate business degree at the University of Cincinnati and eventually a master's uh, in business administration. Um, through the GI Bill, he became a, a, an army ranger and was in Vietnam. And um, you know, my, my mother uh, was one of 10 children, lived in the house that uh, her father, a carpenter, built, which was far too small for all of them. Um, uh, but growing up with parents who moved from, uh, from poverty uh, into middle and eventually uh, upper class socioeconomics um, uh, allowed me, I think, to be taught those values of remembering where you come from, caring for others, doing, uh, choosing to, to live your life in a purposeful way that contributes to the world and makes it a little bit better, hopefully. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I remember my mother, um, you know, she never got her undergraduate degree. She did a couple of different things. She was a, a, a kind of a radiologist assistant. She was a very successful real estate agent, um, and she was always involved in um, in the church. And she was always involved with um, single moms and their families. And she um, she always knew that that was a way that she uh, felt specially connected to giving back to her community. And so those were just some of the values that. Um, I've really taken with me and tried to uh, also bestow upon my two daughters, uh, Ani, who is 19 and in her second year of college. And she was in her first year at Ithaca and has decided due to the pandemic to live at home and, and uh, save some money and go to UVM. So we're happy to have her at home this year. And then my oldest, Brenna, is a senior at Vassar. She's a neuroscience major, um, uh, possibly uh, um, going to med school. And, um, you know, my wife and I have tried uh, really, really hard to instill some of those same values in, in our children, um, even though they've grown up in, in, a, in a fairly privileged uh, environment. And um, so th those are some, some of the key people uh, in my life that have, have really influenced me and shaped me and continue to. Um, some of the places, so, uh, I think the 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 uh, growing up in the suburbs of Detroit and um, 
learning about Detroit in different ways through um, my own white privilege where I was taught that it was a dangerous place um, while at the same time um, doing community service and being brought up with parents who brought us down to uh, the soup kitchen once a month um, to um, actively participate in, in helping with meals. Um, that that uh, really had an impact on me, uh, both from the desire, from, from seeing how um, people were living so differently than I was and the, the needs that were happening not very far from my very comfortable home. Um, and it, it, it fueled that desire in me to, to want to help others. And um, so the other place that was really, really pivotal for me was being a, uh, a Peace Corps volunteer in Botswana in Southern Africa. And um, uh, that was, it was just an amazing experience. And it was, I was, uh, it was my first teaching job. So unfortunately for the students I served, um, I wasn't a seasoned teacher yet and made a lot of mistakes, but they were very uh, patient with me. And um, it, it was one of the first times in my life that I was ever a, a racial minority. I lived in a village called Gagne of uh, about 10,000. And I was one of about five white people in the village. And so I learned a lot from that experience, um, you know, and I had the luxury of, you know, being able to move, um, uh, have the resources to be able to have that experience and go somewhere else um, and um, uh, enjoy the, uh, the, um, the advantages of, of my own uh, white privilege uh, in America in particular. So those things have, have really shaped me. And I think a lot of those pieces have influenced how I've decided to spend my professional career. And um, I was at CVU for uh, about 12 years. Um, I, I first entered education as in special education and wanted to help students with disabilities. And um, students with disabilities will continue to have a special place in my heart as they kind of fight to overcome a lot of challenges that uh, many people don't have. And um, I ended up in a wonderful place at CVU with a fantastic high school and um, great community. And I began to miss the, uh, uh, the racial, the linguistic, the cultural diversity that I had experienced when I was in Botswana um, and when I was in um, uh, White Mountain, small village up outside of Nome in Alaska. And um, it's hard to find that in Vermont as we're the second or third whitest state in the country. And um, so I had always kind of kept my eye on Winooski and Burlington and hadn't really um, um, thought about making the, the move to becoming a superintendent because I'd always thought of myself as, as more of a, a building leader and someone who wanted to be in the day to day a little bit more. And um, through some various mentors, I was encouraged to, to look at this and, and and uh, uh, Winooski School District is unique in that way and that we're a pre-K-12 district all in the same campus. And so um, that felt really good to me because I can still have access to students, to teachers and staff um, and stay connected and visible to people. And that's really where I get a lot of my energy from. Um, while at the same time, moving into superintendency, having my background of a, of a business degree, um, uh, and uh, actually having an interest in the law when I was in undergrad. Um, uh, those things have been very, very helpful um, in the role of superintendent. So um, now that I've kind of moved towards Winooski, I just want to share some information with you about our school district to give you, uh, kind of paint a picture of, of the landscape of, of who we are in Winooski. Um, our, the city of Winooski is about 7,000 uh, people. And in our school, pre-K-12, single campus, we have, um, a few years ago, we were up close to 900. We're hovering around 800 right now. And that is specifically because of federal immigration policy and that they've not been uh, resettling refugees uh, hardly at all in the last couple of years since the uh, Trump administration took over. And so that, has, uh, that is a regular, refugee resettlement is a regular contributor to our um, uh, student enrollment. Um, so we are 
we are hoping that those resettlement numbers will go back to the, the, the normal rates that they had been for over 20 years um, and that we continue to um, uh, be a refugee resettlement community to the levels that we had been in the past. Um, so about 40% of our students are English language learners um, who speak over 20 different languages. And when I say 20, I mean languages, kind of primary languages and also several dialects. Uh, within that. We really have um, some primary languages and we have cultural liaisons who act as interpreters and translators in those languages, um, such as uh, Nepali, uh, Somali, uh, uh, Mai Mai, uh, Arabic, uh, Congolese, Lingala, um, um, and um, uh, many, many other uh, uh, languages, uh, Burmese, so we're fortunate to have all those folks. The, the linguistic and the racial diversity that we have is so different than any other place in Vermont. And that's really what attracted me to coming here because I wanted to continue to learn uh, about different cultures. It's very fascinating to me. And uh, I empathize uh, with the, the, the levels of poverty that are in our community, the levels of food security, the uh, transition of a refugee coming to a new country and settling in and all of the, the things that are associated with that. It felt to me that it was a great uh, move in my career to get back to the original purpose of why I really got into education in the first place. And um, I'm in my eighth year now in Winooski and I can say uh, 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 with a hundred percent assurance that um, that is surely the case. It feels very, very purposeful. Um, there are challenges all the time, and there's lots of new and interesting learning that happens all the time by being surrounded by all kinds of different uh, uh, differences that happen, whether they're religious, cultural, racial, linguistic, uh, socioeconomic. Uh, being in that dynamic environment is, um, is really amazing. Um, so we're also, our students, the way they calculate um, kind of the de facto poverty rating is what's called free and reduced lunch. And we're typically around uh, 60 to 70 percent of our students qualify for free or reduced lunch, which also gives us some additional uh, federal funding um, to support um, students living in poverty and their, um, uh, particularly their math and their literacy needs, which we use. We are also, about a quarter of our students have disabilities, um, which is a higher rate uh, than across the state. Uh, the state average, I believe, is around 16%, so we're pretty significantly over that. And you tend to see higher rates of peoples with, people with disabilities in lower income uh, environments. And because Winooski, uh, the city has uh, a very high rate of affordable or low income housing. Um, you know, I think that is a, that's, that's part of the reason that we see that, that uh, rate. We also, under the, the, the leadership of uh, Robin Hood, who has been in our school district for nearly 40 years, starting as a teacher, and is now our, our special services and early learning director, we get countless um, um, uh, plaudits for uh, serving students with disabilities and our staff and, and Robin uh, go above and beyond to to meet uh, uh, the special needs of, of our students and families. Um, a couple of the things I'd point out about our district are um, Winooski School District and the city were actually coming out of some uh, in 2012 uh, 2011 to 2013 were really in the midst of some chaos leadership chaos uh, there was a lawsuit uh, brought by a, a city manager against the city. There was threats of, of teacher strikes. There was angst between school board members and um, the staff in the school. There was angst between uh, the community and the school and, and local government. And there was a couple of different things that, that started to turn that around. Uh, one was uh, Deke DeCaro became the city manager. Um, uh, also, we had Mike DeCaro, uh, Deke's uh, brother, and then Tori Cleland, who came on uh, to the school board and helped bring in policy governance, a model of, of governing um, in 2012-2013. Uh, 
And then um, fortunately I was hired in um, 20, uh, uh, in the spring of 2013. And so there was a, a turnaround in leadership that was starting to happen. And so it was really exciting to be a part of that because I saw so much potential in the Winooski School District and in the city, being that we're relatively small, a mile square, and we can kind of get our arms around each other and we can really attack uh, some challenges that we have and really uh, bend the curve on some of those things, whether it's food security, uh, academic expectations, homelessness. Um, I feel like there's a real way for us to do that when we, when we band together. And so, uh, in 2014, our board was given the Vermont School Board's Award for Exceptional School Board Leadership based on their work through policy governance. Um, we have continued to have stable, I think, and in, in visionary administrative le leadership um, across the school district and the city. Jesse Baker, uh, a wonderful uh, city manager, has now been in place for a number of years. The city council is, is very high functioning. Um, and we work very closely, the city and the school district, to, to um, try and, and be really consistent in our approach to the community um, and, and keep our communication uh, uh, very consistent as well. Um, also, in starting in 2013 and, and beyond, we've had the opportunity to really grow um, from a learning perspective. We partnered with um, Burlington School District in an Nellie May Education Foundation grant that was really around equity through um, uh, proficiency-based graduation requirements. As we were moving towards the requirement in Vermont to uh, graduate students based on proficiencies, and we have been viewed as a leader in that work across the state and even across New England and continue to do that work. We had our first um, graduating class by proficiencies in this past year, uh, which was fantastic. And so we're continuing that work. We also currently have a grant from what's called the Bar Foundation out of Boston, where we're working on widening what's called the uh, learning ecosystem. So we're working on community-based learning um, in a couple different ways, having our students get out into the community, which is a bit challenging right now during a pandemic, um, but also connecting with community partners and having them either come into the school in person or virtually, um, uh, work at, you know, with our students in, in um, uh, uh, apprenticeships in being able to come in and do interviews and find out about careers, um, do short uh, job shadowing stints and so forth. And so we're in, I think, year three of that grant. We have three more years and we got um, $500,000 to do that work. So we're very excited. And then also we have another grant from the Roland Foundation. Um, and we have one of our high school math teachers, Luke Dorfman, who is really working on uh, equity and anti-racism right now. So we have a lot going on in the school, which is very exciting. Uh, a couple other program notes that I would about the school district. We were an early adopter for preschool and um, we, we are trying to grow our number of preschoolers um, uh, that are accessing program. Uh, about six years ago, we were at 29% and we were up as high as uh, I think a low 70% two years ago. Due to our construction project that I'll talk a little bit about later, um, we have had to decrease the, the number of slots um, in the last year or two, but we will then go back with our, when our building uh, is complete with the renovations, we'll be able to double our capacity. So we're really excited about that. The other thing that we've been doing um, over the last six years is we've been focused on a growth model for our students. So instead of looking um, at the uh, standardized testing, like the SBACs as the end all be all, they are still an important metric for us to consider. Um, but uh, we meet students where they are and we wanna ensure that they are making at least one year's growth every year in uh, uh, literacy and math. And so we track that locally and we don't have data from this past year because of the remote learning environment for the last three months, but in the prior year, K-12, about 74% of our students made at least one year's growth in reading, and two-thirds um, uh, were making that growth in math. And so we're watching that. We have that data for every individual student over time, and uh, we, we uh, track the student and many other metrics in a very personalized way as they move through our system 
which we think is really unique because a student can come to preschool here and all the way through graduation and stay on the same campus. Um, uh, another piece, and then I'll get to the, uh, the construction project. So um, wellness has been a really important part that, um, of my leadership since I've come to Winooski. We're the only, well, I think now there are two or three school districts in the state that have a wellness coordinator who really focus on uh, dimensions of wellness for staff and for students. And our theory of, of action on that is that if our, if our staff members are well across those dimensions, physical, intellectual, uh, mental, emotional, um, uh, spiritual uh, dimensions, then they will be much better equipped to serve our students and they're great models of wellness for our students. Um, We've done a lot around food security uh, underneath the umbrella of wellness. We're a community eligibility provision, so all of our students receive free breakfast and lunch. Uh, we have fresh fruits and vegetables for K through eight every day. Uh, we stuff backpacks for students that are in need on Fridays so that they have food for the weekends. We work with the wonderful Vermont Food Bank and have what's called Veggie Van Gogh every other week where families and students can come and get bags of fresh vegetables. Um, to take home, and uh, we've been we've been uh, um, uh, uh, noticed by the Vermont Business uh, Le uh, Leadership uh, Wellness Award and uh, Worksite Wellness Awards um, for a lot of that work. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about. I'm going to try and look at the Q and A while I'm doing this about the capital project. Um, Oh, great questions. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer a couple of these questions uh, while I see them, and then I'll talk about the capital project. So uh, Glenn, thanks for your question. It says, should a candidate to be a principal of a school be required to have had a teaching a classroom experience? Um, I think so. Um, you don't necessarily have to have that, and it differs by state. Um, but what I have found um, in my role as kind of an assistant or a house director at CVU and then the principal was, and now as superintendent, when I can talk to teachers and staff members about my experience, um, uh, that builds a lot of credibility and it helps, um, and, it, and, it, and it really helps to build that um, trust in that relationship. Um, so I think it should be required, thanks. Um, are there teachers in Winooski exploring using curriculum from the 1619 project? Uh, not specifically right now. I would say that we definitely do have uh, teachers who are um, uh, incorporating more history and humanities types of curriculum that go beyond the, the typically narrow curriculum of how we present our history. Um, and to include more perspectives of indigenous peoples, um, but the 1619 project specifically, no. Um, and then what was different about the class that graduated due to proficiency compared to prior years with different graduation criteria? So the old way was uh, what was called Carnegie units or uh, credits. So basically if you took a class, you went to class enough, you passed the, the tests enough to get at least a D minus on a, uh, uh, some sort of a, um, a grading scale and you accrued enough credits, then you got a diploma. Proficiency is about um, uh, showing very specific skills and content uh, understanding and having very specific descriptors in uh, what we call scales or rubrics uh, that describe uh, how how people sh how students show those skills and those content proficiencies. So we have those scripted out, everything from communication to financial literacy, and students have copies of those, so they know exactly the descriptor that they have to meet to meet the minimum proficiency. And then once they've met that, they can continue to grow and head for. Uh, areas of, of what we call uh, uh, distinction uh, well beyond that. So it is a big transition. Uh, we certainly do not have it perfected, 
but I think it's a much better way of learning and graduating students um, so that they will be better prepared uh, not only for, for post-secondary education, but for uh, career and, um, and for life in general, um, because they have to, have to get to a much deeper understanding uh, as described by these uh, proficiencies. Okay, so I wanna tell you a little bit about our, um, our uh, capital project, which is really exciting, um, in large part because Right now, I see myself having really three big priorities, and they are um, seeing this capital project through, which started the middle of June and runs through uh, August of 22. And then um, uh, the second part is, is navigating the reopening and the continuation of learning throughout this pandemic whenever it may um, conclude. And then um, the third thing, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit later, is our commitment to becoming an anti-racist school district. So a little bit about um, our capital project. So we spent about two years uh, evaluating our facility, uh, having people come in, writing reports, um, uh, looking at all of our systems, uh, uh, such as HVAC, uh, you know, our, our water systems, uh, everything. And uh, this building had been pieced together um, over many, many years, starting in 1957 and then having about every eight to 10, eight to 12 years, another additional project uh, on the facility itself. And it wasn't um, all connected very thoughtfully. So, uh, um, we started doing all that work, we assessed the need, and then we gathered together a group of stakeholders and we started talking about what, what do we want the building to, to look like uh, in the future and not, not just for the next few years, but when you're, you're renovating a, a school building, you're thinking about the next 50 years and how do you, how do you um, uh, create a building that's gonna be useful uh, well into the future. And so we did that and then, um, and we worked with some architects and, um, you know, priced everything out and uh, the board selected an option to bring forward to the community that was that uh, price tag of $57.8 million. And in May of 2019, the, 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 the city uh, voted and we passed the bond very narrowly. And so then we began the next layers of work, which then resulted in the project starting this uh, uh, past June. And we're very excited about it. Uh, some of the new pieces will be a new middle school, a new gym, a um, new cafeteria, a new entrance to the building, and some additional elementary pods, uh, classrooms. And we've built um, the middle school and the elementary pods around the idea of flexible um, uh, and collaborative learning environments where we can integrate our English language learning and our special needs support services, our literacy and our math support services all right into um, uh, the classroom. So we're very excited about that. We had great news recently in that we got a USDA loan for the full amount, which means that we believe we're gonna save close to $11 million over the life of, of, of the 30 year bond which is a tremendous uh, uh, boon to the, to the taxpayers of, of Winooski. And, um, but it's gonna be a big job um, uh, over the next uh, two years to ensure that that project uh, comes in on budget and uh, um, that we, we get the product that we want for, for generations in the future. Um, I'm gonna go back and take a look at some of these. Okay, so this is a great question and I think it will get us into some of the, um, the anti-racism uh, pieces that I wanted to talk about. It says, um, when Winooski students interact with those from other schools in Vermont, as in sports, science fairs, and so on, has the diversity of your students led to any challenges, difficulties, and our opportunities for learning and growth? Uh, so I'll start with that one, absolutely. I think uh, in general, it has led to um, uh, good relations, but also, I know directly from some of our students, they have um, um, they've experienced racism, particularly during athletic events. Um, 
and, and not just from uh, other student athletes, but also from coaches and from parents, fans. Um, so that's incredibly uh, 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 distressing to us. When we hear about it, we try to, we try to let our students um, uh, try to make sure that they're comfortable so that they tell us about those things when they happen. And then we report and work with the other school districts um, and to do the best that we can to, to hopefully um, uh, repair the harm uh, that's been done. Um, but also there's been a lot of really positive experiences that our students have had. We have a lot of exchanges. You know, there are many other, particularly high schools who are very curious and wanna learn about the different cultures that are rep represented in Winooski. So it's pretty common over the course of a year that we um, host other high school classes um, and they will come or we will go there and, and, and have student to student conversations about their refugee experience or their experience of being a, uh, a student of color in Vermont. Um, and then the next part of the question is, can you point to examples of success in bridging ethnic and cultural divides either within the school or in the community? Uh, so that, yeah, this question really, I'll give you one very specific example that happened very early after I arrived in Winooski was, uh, in the high school, there was, uh, uh, there was a cultural uh, battle going on amongst high school boys because there uh, was Somali students and what's called Somali Bantu students. And they were not getting along at all and it was resulting in um, physical fights and altercations. And uh, the way with, that we bridged that was we got the, um, the Somali elders involved uh, who are primarily men and uh, we spoke with them about what was happening and we asked their help. And you know, th this is a very deep issue uh, for Somalis because it goes back generations uh, for them in their families uh, across these different groups. And, uh, but what they decided was that education was far too important um, to allow this to continue. And so they got together and they made it clear to all of the parents in their cultural group and the students that were involved uh, that this needed to stop. And it was their expectation that it was gonna stop. And it did. Um, it was just such a powerful moment of engaging parents and elders and community members uh, in the value of education and coming together. And uh, so that's an example I, I always um, uh, think of. Um, let's see, go back. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit. Um, oh, okay, so here, here I'll answer a few more of these questions and then um, should teachers, principals, superintendents live in the communities where they teach? Um, so I think that's a bit of a double-edged sword. I have not lived in the community. I live in Colchester and I personally don't think that it should be a requirement. Um, because I think people have different circumstances. As a principal and a, and a superintendent, um, I spent a lot of time in my communities um, already. And um, I, I feel like uh, for me, it would, um, it's, already, it's already hard sometimes to protect some of my personal time. Um, and, and I enjoy part of it. Whenever I go down to Church Street, I run into a lot of my old CVU students and it's wonderful to catch up with them. And there's moments where, you know, I, I don't want that. I just wanna be with my wife and have a date night and not be stopping and talking to people all the time. Um, so I think it depends on the people. I, I don't think it should be a requirement, but I think there's certainly some benefits. We have a number of our teachers who live in Winooski and they are just a, an integral part of the community in many, many ways. Um, and it helps them build relationships, not just with their students, but with their parents and uh, other people across the community that, that, that really bring us together. Um, homogenous or heterogeneous grouping and class size. So we, we kind of have a mix. Um, we have some homogenous groupings um, in that we have what are called newcomer uh, programs. So our students who are learning English uh, are grouped together and get intense uh, instruction to uh, uh, move them as quickly as possible to, to English literacy so that they can uh, gain social and eventually enough academic language that they can um, get into their, uh, to the regular programming. 
another example of homogenous grouping would be that we have students with emotional and behavioral disabilities and we have a therapeutic classroom at each level, elementary, middle, and high, that is built to meet the, uh, their therapeutic and behavioral needs and learning needs. Um, and then we have a lot of heterogeneous groupings. So in regular education, uh, all of our um, elementary, middle, and high are heterogeneous. Um, teachers will sometimes break out um, student groups in different ways. Um, so they may break out based on reading level and do it more homogenous uh, or heterogeneous. Um, uh, but that gets done at the classroom level. And then class size, we have worked really hard because of the complexity of our student population. Now I know, for example, uh, you know, a second grade classroom, we try to keep those numbers um, uh, below 18. And when you think about a quarter of those students having a disability, 40% uh, of them having English language learning needs, um, and 60 to 70% of them living in poverty, that brings a level of complexity for the classroom teacher um, that, that can be really challenging. And so that's why we've really chosen to commit resources to keep those class sizes lower. Um, I think we're getting kind of close to, um, I think it's 2.45 we'll go. So, um, and I see a question about uh, how the group called Winooski Students for Anti-Racism brought significant proposals to the school board and has accomplished many of their goals. So this was a very interesting process that ha is continued. So um, with the, the murders of, of uh, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, uh, Ahmaud Arbery, um, uh, you know, the, the uh, national, state, and local um, uh, narrative changed, and there was so much pain in communities of color. Um, and we certainly felt that here. And what happened originally was our staff, we started to work together on this. And so right after graduation in, in later June, we had staff coming together and talking about that first of all, getting together just to process what was happening because all this pain and racism that was happening during a pandemic, uh, people's emotional states were, were, were pretty, pretty fragile. Um, and people wanted action. They wanted to do something and change things. So as a staff, we started getting together and working on that and identified some areas that we wanted to work on. And while that was happening, a student group, um, the, the uh, uh, Winooski students for anti-racism started mobilizing. And then they put together uh, um, a list of eight demands that they presented to the school board. And um, if any of you have been following, what happened was our, our governance processes at the board level kind of fell apart. Um, it was a combination of um, virtual board meetings, um, where there was not enough controls around the meeting itself. Um, I think board members, myself, being influenced by the emotion that students were um, uh, conveying and also uh, wanting to support students in this work because they were bringing it forward with such passion. And so we floundered, uh, the board and I, we floundered for a number of meetings trying to figure out what's the best way to go about this? And so I think that we've gotten to a good place recently and we actually have a board retreat with um, Winooski students um, uh, 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 tomorrow and with my district leadership team and the board where we're gonna do some restorative circles about uh, some of the harm that may have happened during that process. And then we're gonna mobilize and, commit and, and create committees and structures around the demands. Six of the eight demands were accepted by the board and they're things like um, uh, recruiting um, staff of color and putting resource and time and money into doing that properly. We had started to do that a little bit but um, it got waylaid during the pandemic. Um, we're talking about implementing restorative justice practices which we have a new grant with Spectrum Family and New Services. So a couple of these things, we were already kind of in motion. Um, and um, the board is, is committed to uh, uh, dedicating resources uh, uh, towards these means. 
the other thing that um, um, uh, in the demands that students want to do is they want to uh, create um, a comprehensive mentoring program, particularly for ELL students, but for all students to make sure that they have um, uh, adequate adult leadership in helping them uh, move towards their goals. Um, we're also looking at like an audit of our uh, policies, procedures, curriculum, um, our building, doing student and staff and parent interviews to see if our, uh, all of those things um, reflect our, our student body or not, or if we are kind of continuing to um, uh, uh, write policies and procedures and implement curriculum from a more traditional uh, Eurocentric uh, perspective. And I know that we will certainly find some things that, uh, a lot of things that will need to be changed. And I think we have changed some things along the way. Um, so I, I'm, I'm so amazed at our, our students uh, have done an incredible job of leadership um, in this respect. And uh, we have shifted this year in the high school to what's called an integrated and thematic uh, curriculum. And one of the themes that half of our students will be working on is, is uh, uh, social racial justice. So they're gonna be able to continue to do this work uh, as part of their curriculum, as part of their proficiencies moving towards graduation. So it's not just an add-on to what they're um, trying to do to, to meet the requirements of a, a proficiency-based diploma. Um, so I'm really excited about that, that we've created. It has created a, a lot of, um, you know, so in addition to trying to get school reopened during a pandemic and managing um, a $57.8 million capital project, and then having this very important and very emotional work uh, on top of that, I think that we've struggled from a capacity perspective to be able to do all of this work really well. And we're in the process of really trying to prioritize it, um, delegate it properly so we can get a lot more people working on it. Um, let's see, have any, uh, here's another question. Have any issues or concerns arisen with particular regard to the education and overall school experience of girls and young women who are from diverse ethnic, cultural, and uh, spiritual backgrounds? Have families objected to some classes due to gender? Um, so that last part, I have not heard of, of uh, many objections um, to classes or attack activities. I know uh, from my experience, I, I started about four years ago with some other staff members. We started a spring soccer program and I coached the girls side and um, um, some colleagues of me coached the boys. And we wanted to give them a spring opportunity because for a lot of our students, playing club soccer was, was not necessarily uh, accessible because of cost, because of transportation. So we wanted to bring it to them. And we had a nice partnership with the Nordic Soccer Club to do that. Um, and I did find some situations where I had some, some young girls who really wanted to play, but their parents would not let them play um, for various reasons. Sometimes it was that they needed to come home and take care of their younger siblings and make dinner. Sometimes it was because um, girls in that particular uh, uh, religious or cultural um, group did not play sports, that there was not a, uh, an allowance or an expectation that they would engage in, in athletic activities. Um, and so there were times where I would, uh, I have gone and talked to parents uh, with um, some of our interpreters and advocated for students to be a part of, of a soccer program or something else. And uh, I try to balance respect for um, folks' beliefs um, with the fact that um, we have a lot of opportunities, great opportunities for some of our students, and they may be new to parents, um, but it's important to support their students in trying, trying new things and engaging with opportunities, and that's a part of students' overall health. It's a part of our overall programming that's available. Um, so there's, there's uh, certainly been some of that. Um, yeah, I, I'd say that's, uh, I, I don't know that we, we certainly have had some situations uh, back to some of the difficulties. You know, we had a specific situation where a, a Muslim uh, girl was on a softball team and the, the umpire was telling her that, you know, she had to, take off her hijab um, or she had to um, 
uh, tuck it in, or, uh, make sure that it wasn't uh, flowing around and, um, uh, you know, getting into these discussions in the heat of an athletic event um, and sometimes with people not having the proper background on um, uh, why uh, a young woman might be wearing a hijab, what the meaning of that is. Um, you know, so we've certainly had some of those issues and we try to do two things. We try to um, both protect our students um, and make sure that they feel cared for and supported. And we try to also educate people that we come upon that, that may not um, have all of the, the learning about these particular um, cultural and religious um, uh, things. All right, let's see. <laughs> yes, so are the uh, the F-35s taking off and landing over Winnesi affecting learning and has the construction project taken the uh, noise levels? Uh, yes. So the F-35s, I just met with the National Guard a couple weeks ago um, where they shared um, kind of an overview of their schedules, but um, in the spring and in the fall are the most disrupted times and they're loud and they they fly fairly close to our school. And so uh, they do disrupt, you know, it's, it's not uncommon during those warm months when windows are open or if a classroom is working outside, which we have a lot of outdoor classrooms, we have, we set up tents to have eight outdoor classrooms right now, um, where you have to stop, you know, for a minute or something because you really cannot hear each other. So we do our best working with the city, working with the National Guard, and even working with the airport because we found um, you know, that some of the commercial patterns, uh, flying patterns were affecting um, noise as well. Um, and the construction project also. Um, uh, we did a lot of the, the site work over the summer, uh, but there will be times where the noise levels certainly go up um, due to the project. And we do everything that we can to, to mitigate that, to try and do it um, at times uh, where it won't um, uh, impact the learning uh, as much. Uh, let's see. Could you explain the debate or over whether to have an armed police officer in the Winooski schools this year and its current status? So the current status is that um, our school resource officer, uh, Jason Zeider, he is in the school. He is doing his job per normal. Um, what happened was there was uh, kind of going back to that the governance issues that happened uh, with the board around the student demands was there was confusion about whether or not the, the demand document was kind of a strict and literal policy document or whether it should be coupled with the board discussion about it and uh, should more be taken as a, a, a guiding docket, a doc, document with the, the spirit of it and not the literal interpretation. So we ended up going back and forth on that, unfortunately, which, which caused some angst for, for all involved. Um, but it is part of a memorandum of understanding that the board has with the city um, to, su to supply a school resource officer. We've had one in the Winooski schools for over 20 years. Um, since I've been here, I feel like it's been very successful and integral part. Um, I am open to the discussion around, could we have, uh, uh, could we meet the same needs without having a gun on campus? Um, and we are uh, committed to, in the next few months, holding some community education, engagement, and voice around school safety and security from a broader perspective to uh, uh, hopefully get uh, the community engaged around what does it mean to feel safe and secure um, in the school and even in the broader community? And what are we doing as a whole community, as a school, to ensure that people are safe and secure? And can we do it differently? You know, if in fact there are members of our community, uh, which I know there are some, uh, that feel uh, unsafe because there is a gun on campus, are there ways for us to um, uh, look at that differently? So we are definitely. Um, uh, going to be doing that in the next couple of months. We're working out a process right now because the board needs to notify the city um, during the budget cycle, you know, in December, whether or not they would like that service of a school resource officer um, for next year. Uh, let's see. 
so are there ways that the culture of the international students can be shared with the larger school population? Um, I'm not sure if you mean larger school population outside of Winooski or even just within, but um, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Yes, there definitely are ways to do that. Um, we do do that within our community in that uh, we have students who go down a couple times a year to our senior center. They have a cultural uh, uh, luncheon where they bring foods and talk about you know, uh, what they are and the importance of them to their particular culture. They um, do dancing, uh, Nepali dancing in particular. And uh, so that's kind of a way we do it across the community. We do have some, uh, also some celebrations that happen uh, sometimes at the school, um, sometimes in other places in the community to recognize uh, uh, some of the different cultural celebrations that happen. Um, the, the part that I think we find is sometimes um, because we are so white in Vermont, we constantly get requests for our students to share their cultures and it can become um, a drain on them, you know, given uh, uh, some of them, you know, their, their, their family needs, uh, their academic needs, and to continually ask students to be kind of the representatives, um, you know, can take a toll. Uh, while many students and families will, you know, love to share uh, their culture, um, we also really work with them to make sure that they're feeling respected, uh, uh, not only of their culture, but of their time. Um, uh, so that they can be in, in control of making those decisions. Um, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, School-wide discipline policy. So yes, we do have a school-wide discipline policy. Um, everybody, uh, you're required to have what's called a school conduct, uh, school discipline and conduct policy, which we do have that's pretty broad. And then underneath that, we have uh, across our school, we have school-wide expectations, which is the acronym HART. And within each one of those, uh, there are very specific expectations for honesty, engagement, and so forth. Um, and then we have what are called uh, major and uh, minor behaviors. And so teachers are uh, trained to deal with uh, uh, all of those behaviors, but particularly to have strategies to deal with the minor behaviors in the classroom. The expectation is that teachers are skilled enough to deal with most of those and to keep kids in the classroom so that they're not losing time learning. And then um, when they get to a point where they need support, we have what are called um, uh, behavioral uh, uh, support teams. We have a behavior coach and a couple of behavior interventionists at the elementary and at the middle high. And so they work with teachers, they work with parents and directly with students to wrap around uh, and to help. Um, and we have a progression of that because the goal is always to keep students in the classroom getting be first best instruction. Um, and then we have a variety of ways after that if those strategies are not working um, to uh, keep trying new things, engaging new people, um, in the process to try and meet the needs of those students. And then of course, we, we unfortunately then at, uh, uh, um, as last resorts, we, we do have a suspension. We rarely suspend students, um, but it is a part of our policy. Sean, this has been wonderful. What a great window, not only just into the schools, but into the community of Winooski. We really, really enjoyed you. Thank you so, so much. We hope you'll come back sometime. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Carol. And thanks everybody for, for having me. It was, uh, it was wonderful to talk to you and great questions. Thank Good. you. Thank you, everyone. See you next week. Thanks, Carol. Thanks, thanks Michael. Michael. Thank you so much, Sean. It was great. Really appreciate it so much, and we learned a lot. Oh, good. I'm glad. We'll be in touch. All right. Thanks Take you. care. Best to Krista, Bye. too. Thanks for all Yeah, that. I will. Thanks. Bye now.